Hello everyone and welcome back to Realism Overall Sandbox in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1. In this video I introduce the Methalox version of the Shuttle Mark II. I've been continuing its development even though I'm rather preoccupied by Flight Sim 2020, I'll have to admit. But the Methalox version replaces the MMH and Mon3, the storable fuels that the previous version had, with methane and oxygen. So I had to replace the fuels back here. And of course we have to have different engines because we can no longer have the AJ-10 190s. And so I made a new model of my ED-1 engine. The ED-1 engine previously had a very sad sort of model. Uh, this one is a little bit niftier looking. It's a methane oxygen engine that has multiple restarts and can throttle a little bit and well a lot actually but it has 30 kilonewtons so it's uh, it's about the same size as the AJ-10190 and so it's more or less a drop-in replacement that has uh, methane and oxygen as its propellants so we still have the tanks here but we get a little bit more delta V out of them because we don't need to carry the same mass of methane and oxygen as we did the MMH and Mon3. And so the same amount of fuel from the hydrogen and oxygen that we're using for the BE7s to transfer to the moon will get us more delta V and hopefully actually transfer us to the moon this time. So yeah, the main problem, I haven't fixed some of the other issues like I wanted the body flap and um, which got ailerons and everything. but. Uh, that I will do later because the first order of business is making sure this can actually get to the moon and do what it's supposed to do, right? So uh, once I get that down, we'll reassess. I'm sure that the body of this is actually heavier than it needs to be. But since I have to add stuff like the abort pack and the ailerons and body flap, I want to make sure that we can get to the moon like this. And then I'll see about lightening up the dry mass of this. The landing gear is a little bit of a concern. It's pretty heavy, actually. And you can see uh, it's max safe load. Uh, here's our problem. See, the max safe load is 46 tons. Now, it's not going to land like this. It's not going to land 52 tons. It's going to land without the stuff in the bay, uh, ideally speaking. So, none of that. So, it's going to be landing at 24 tons max. And actually... Um, if it ever lands at all, it should have those pretty much empty, so 16 tons. So we don't need landing gear this heavy. The problem is that if I scale it down, like uh, right now, it is going to look really awkward. Heck, it looks really awkward right now. So we're carrying more landing gear mass than we need for the load that we plan to land. But if I just scale it down, it looks awkward. So that's the rub. Uh, so I need that's one way to uh, lighten up the shuttle mark 2 and There are other ways what I mean. I've already done one way technically by uh, changing the propellant to Methane and oxygen in the back now. I'm not wedded to changing that we could because storable fuels seems to be the way NASA is going with a lot of stuff but this will make sense for what we're doing. I'm going to try and launch it on Starship. Now, somebody in the comments said, but why would you launch it on Starship? And it's, a, it's an okay question. The comment said, uh, if Starship will carry four astronauts plus a bigger payload than the shuttle and land on the moon and is fully reusable, uh, why would you even think about launching this uh, shuttle with Starship? And my answer was, because this doesn't need a whole bunch of trips with other Starships to refuel it in LEO. Uh, so it's more convenient, and frankly, I will do a great deal to avoid having to refuel Starship in low Earth orbit. I, I think, uh, you know, from, from a fan's perspective, you know, like a SpaceX fan's perspective, you know, refueling in orbit seems easy, right? I mean, it's, it's great. Uh, they got refuel it in orbit, send a whole bunch of Starships to refuel it. Each Starship carries 100 tons to orbit right now, as far as the estimates are concerned, so you need 10 trips. Uh, ideally, after a while, if they get the masses down, you need six trips, assuming everything's reusable. So, at least that's as far as I can figure it. So, even if you're launching every week, you're talking about taking two and a half months to refuel it. And let's say if you launch every day, it's still 10 days, uh, uh, you know, with the current uh, loads, but every day is quite a push uh, at you know, historical levels. Uh, you can uh, envision whatever revolutions you would like, but I prefer not to expect too many revolutions coming at once. <laughs> I mean, so um, I have that 
uh, thing. And, you know, I remember the shuttle. And they said to us that the shuttle was going to launch every week. It was going to be very reusable. And it was going to be able to replace everything, and so you wouldn't need to have other launch vehicles or anything like that. They closed down the Delta and Titan line until the Challenger disaster. And it didn't need an abort system, right? Uh, because it was got to be very, very reliable. All the parts would be very, very reliable, so it doesn't need an abort system. Uh, so I've heard these things before, and this Shuttle Mark II embodies the lesson that None of that actually happened, <laughs> right? So we are going to have an abort system. Uh, we are not going to make this do all the things. And I don't want Starship to do all the things either. Even if something is reusable, specialization is good. We don't use a 747 to fly regional jet routes. And, you know, you, you get the picture here. Uh, specialization is a competitive advantage and eventually uh, it, even if Starship does everything it says it's gonna do the person that's gonna be able to make a component that does one part of that better in a reusable fashion let's say landing on the moon right so you just keep your lunar lander in orbit around the moon land get back into orbit but you make that part really really super efficient because Starship has to do all these other things um, so it's not necessarily efficient for just that part that's a competitive advantage. So you don't want to be the, the, the stagnant company that hasn't changed in ages because things just work and you've gotten all the contracts and all. You want to keep thinking about what you need to do to gain that kind of advantage. And so Shuttle Mark II. Now, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if this is the way to do it, but it's an idea, okay? I mean, you have to explore ideas. You can't just go, the, the Starship is going to do everything, and that's the end of everything. So so that's my logic, and let's put this on Star Starship and see what happens. And you got to admit, it looks pretty cute riding on Starship like this. Certainly cuter than the shuttle, which I previously placed on Starship. Hopefully we won't have to worry about balance too much, but it is still pretty heavy on this side here. But yeah, I, I like the look of it, to be honest. Anyway, but when you think about it, it's a completely reusable system. Only needs one launch to send crew over to the moon. Um, so in an emergency, maybe it could be used or... Remember, Starship isn't going to be sent to the moon on every single trip, right? I mean, sometimes it's going to be launched to low Earth orbit with tourists. You know, tourists that aren't going all the way out to the moon. They just want to see Earth from orbit and it might be, might be carrying 100 tourists. Who knows? Whatever. However many tourists can fit inside there. So they're going up, launching with it, uh, and they're doing the touristy thing. And meanwhile, uh, some crew can uh, go into our little Shuttle Mark II and head off to the moon. And, you know, Starship will just head back down with its tourists and the little shuttle will head over to the moon. And maybe the Shuttle Mark II is carrying some, uh, some replacement crews, so it'll do a crew rotation, quick crew rotation. Or it could be carrying uh, replacement parts for a lunar lander, like a Starship lunar lander, for instance, which should hang out in the moon. We don't want any of our lunar landers back. I mean, they should all be hanging out in the moon, ready to bring people down. We don't want to see them again. If you want to put them in the museum, make the museum on the moon, okay? The only time a lunar lander has to come back is if something goes horribly wrong like Apollo 13. I never want to see them again. <laughs> so it's just much more efficient to have the lunar landers stay around the moon and land and uh, launch again and just deliver fuel as necessary and fix them, fix them around the moon at a station or something. So uh, this could carry the replacement parts to fix up a uh, lunar lander like that. Uh, that won't be hopefully take too much space. But yeah, let's see if this can launch properly, uh, reserving fuel for return and everything on uh, all relevant stages. Oh, did I accidentally have a payload in here? I better check. Oh, I did. Let me remove the payload. That'll all be tourist capacity, okay? Well, we're gonna say that the tourists are gonna be hanging out in there. And we've already got a fairly heavy module here, 20 tons uh, for crew and all. So that'll take care of that. I really need to hire more Kerbals in this save. Okay. So here we go. Okay, we are properly lined up with the moon, so we are looking to actually go there this time. SAS on, uh, throttle is up. And 
engines. Well, I really need to make my own Raptor engines just so that I can put them in clusters instead of having 37 engines. There's going to be some lag here. And here we go, the ignition. And launch. In retrospect, this is much better than putting it inside Starship. Yeah, last time I talked about putting it inside Starship, but being able to put it outside and have the tourists inside is certainly much better. And there is still cargo capacity. Uh, the Shuttle Mark II is only 52 tons, so we can have all the accommodations we need for the tourists. That's not going to be a problem. One thing we can say with relative certainty is that the uh, Shuttle Mark II does not pose any sort of aerodynamic complications for this situation. Uh, as far as the Griffins are concerned, it's another case of the uh, similar to the landing gear. I can scale them up, but they get really heavy because tweak scale. The way tweak scale scales up the mass, they just get uh, obscenely heavy. They're two tons now uh, combined. I mean, maybe two tons is about right, which is fine, but they look a little bit small, right? But if I scale it up any more, if I scale it up the way I wanted it to be scaled up, they were five tons. So, I don't think the Griffins are going to be five tons. I'm not sure, but... I'm going to reserve 10% of uh, Super Heavy's propellant, so that's 18 seconds. So, shut down, separate, ignition. Gotta get me some of those SpaceX hydraulic piston separatron things. Actually, that's probably doable. Come to think of it. Okay, pretty quick roll here. Maybe a little bit too vigorous. And there we go. Didn't get a very good name for it yet. The Shuttle Mark II. There were some offered, but I wasn't. Nothing clicked, per se. I mean, I'm just really satisfied with the look of this right now. With the Shuttle Mark II riding on the back of Starship. It's just. I think this is right somehow. This is the way it should be. Okay, we're coming close to the end of the orbital burn. Just sort of managing things really close to apoapsis, and we'll see how much Delta V Starship has left after this. Very important for the potential return. But for all, we want everything to be reusable here properly reusable. We may still have to upgrade the engines. Seems like they're getting better chamber pressure out of the Raptors these days, so probably safe to increase the stats at some point. Okay, that's good enough. 216 by 178. And we've already got crew in the shuttle, so let's separate. Whoa, that's a little bit more vigorous than I wanted. Um, <laughs> Okay, oh, um, we're great. Ah, there we go. Make sure we're controlling from here. We don't strictly speak, well, actually we do. We do need to put the wings down so that we can open the cargo bay. Which has the radiators inside, so. Okay, so this little guy is ready. And I'll start a fuel cell for power. And now this has the remnants of the decoupler. Otherwise, 1,328 meters per second should be enough to come back home and land safely. That shouldn't be any problem at all. Uh, 1,000 meters per second is definitely enough to land on the tail, assuming that it can land on the tail at all. Uh, but uh, that's not what we're testing today. So let's try and get to the moon now. 
We still have Mo, uh, MMH and Mon3 for the wing RCS. I didn't replace those yet. Don't even need, uh, know if we need the wing RCS at all. The, uh, it's not going to be too much extra mass. It's like 0.1 tons, but it's something. Okay, and ignition. Our four BE7s. Gosh, I hope we don't crash into Starship. <laughs> Let's check that. Uh, separation at closest approach. But not close enough to be a uh, peril to us. Okay, well, on this stage we're gonna come up a little bit short again, but we'll see how the service module does with its new methane and oxygen. This physical room for more. I think we're utilizing about 56% uh, of the actual space in the back. Okay, yeah, not quite there. And we're going to eject out the fuel tanks. So that's what these decouplers are. This time, off they go. And... Oh no! The oxygen was all in there. The liquid oxygen. Oh, shoot. Well, gosh darn it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I need to check the priority. Well, we get to launch again. Uh, so they, they still had the remaining oxygen in them instead of in the Shell Mark II. Fuel priority issue. All right, I'll launch again. You know what? I'll uh, skip recording the launch for you guys and we'll just pick it up where it's uh, done with this part of the burn and about to continue onward to the moon. Okay, we're about to run out of this stage. I decided to just hold prograde this time. I don't think that did anything better, but... That's that. The plot's probably wrong anyway. And so... Uh, nope, let's shut down. Verify that there really isn't any fuel in those. And now decouple. <laughs> Off they go. Oh, that was a little bit awkward. Alright, so... Oh, I didn't actually group these. Oh, okay. Well, all right, that's fine. And not those engines, but these engines. The new engines. And here comes our orbit. Well, if we get into a tight orbit around the moon, that's not enough to come back. So we'll make a loose orbit around the moon and then try to return. Okay, that'll do for starters. Now we're not carrying a docking port, that's another extra load that we're going to need to take into consideration. But I've been pretty generous about... wait, where is our fuel? Okay, I have to unlock the fuel cell hydrogen. There we go. Alright. Um, yeah, I've left a lot of margin. It's actually pretty heavy uh, for something of its size, so... I think that I can lighten certain parts up. I'll have to check the math on that, and we'll see. The landing gear in particular, but uh, just the body itself, I think. I made it fairly thick. And perhaps it doesn't need to be. The Ford portion, the cabin, probably needs to be about as heavy as it is. Uh, the rest of it, maybe not so much. Technically, I used the density of aluminum for the cargo bay doors. I could go to carbon composite and that should lighten those up. We do have boil off. That's another thing. I did put MLI layers though. I mean, it says that, right? Yeah, I see some MLI stuff. Maybe, well, I mean... Unfortunately, this is all one part, so no matter how you turn, unless your nose on to the sun, there's going to be plenty of boil off. Okay, I feel like these are the fallback textures again, not the right ones. I don't know. I thought I had fixed that in this install, but I'm not sure. Okay, retrograde. Oh, we definitely want to shut down the BE-7s, otherwise they'll use our fuel cell fuel, which is not good. Okay. Settling fuel down. 
and ignition. Still got the decoupler remnant there. I hate when that happens. Just a matter of how I subassembly the thing. Okay, for safety's sake, I think that should be as tight as we make it right now, which is not tight at all. So improvements will need to be made. And I'm gonna go around once and then contrive to exit. So we're going around this way. I think here we will try and boost up and out. Uh, you don't know you don't need to do anything more. I want to save some for RCS fuel for entry into Earth's atmosphere as well, you see. So, it's tricky. Unfortunately, the way I've got it coming in now, it's very inclined. Actually, that might not be the worst thing for avoiding the radiation belts. I forget. There are better inclination and worse inclination, so I'll have to leave it up to NASA to figure out exactly how best to bring this back in. Um, obviously, this would be difficult to rendezvous with, or, but coming back down to Cape Canaveral is not necessarily a problem. So there is that. It's only if we need to rendezvous with it in orbit that this is uh, somewhat inconvenient. But anyway, uh, we're going to go for a two-hour lap and then do this ejection burn. Okay, node. Yeah, this is not particularly close to the moon right now. I don't know why that bit is shinier than this bit. I'm not clear on that. Okay, well, the start burn is probably not when we need to start. You should start now. All right, let's see how the Earth side of this is shaping up. That's a long trip back, seven days. Uh, this is obviously not the way we should go, but uh, that's the way we're going. Let me try 75 to 76 kilometers and see whether that's safe or not. This is a bit high, but... We'll see. Also, we needed some extra fuel for boil-off considerations. I hope that's enough. Again, we need the methane and oxygen for RCS fuel once we get there. Uh, it's boiling off a little bit too much. Maybe I should carry some extra extra MLI layers or something. I didn't top them off. So we're trying to come in at 60 degrees, close to 76 kilometers periapsis. We'll see how that goes. Okay, we are glowing red, very red. There is the overheating indicators we saw last time. Pitch is well managed for now. Apoapsis is coming down. Speed is coming down, more importantly. Pitch, about half of it, almost half of it being used. Okay, we have some overheating. Still about half of the pitch being used right now. And we're going up, so that's the worst. We could probably come in lower. We are below GTO levels, so that's an improvement. Part of it is that we're not carrying the fuel tanks. Remember last time I didn't eject out fuel tanks, we didn't have decouplers on them. We're also coming back with less fuel overall, so that's a little bit tighter. But yeah, this, this is looking a lot better on the first capture. If we get the right inclination, this will probably be safer, too, in terms of radiation. I'd say on this pass, we dumped about half the velocities we needed to dump, so on the next pass, we get into a nice low Earth orbit. So if we get rid of the same amount of velocity, I think that's pretty good. Um, 14,000, I'll have to review where 
I, I know there are radiation belts at uh, that cover 14,660 kilometers, but, you know, it depends on exactly where they are. But it's certainly an improvement from last time. But still work to do because we didn't really get into a tight orbit around the moon. We don't have some of the other features like a docking port. And this is pretty darn tight. But anyway, there you have it. Uh, Shell Mark II development continues. And I'm still looking for a good name for this little guy. So keep that in mind. And with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.